Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Tuition is always voluntary on Patreon, and please remember that we have Academy themed gear available at the Academy store. There are links in the description. Today we will be talking about the most advanced rocket technology that has never flown. Rockets have been around a long time now, from the first Chinese solid propellant versions to the most powerful liquid-fueled rocket to ever launch, so far. Early in spacecraft development, it was found that adding a converging-diverging nozzle, called a de Laval nozzle, could dramatically increase efficiency. This design was developed from the work of Giovanni Venturi. He experimented with fluid pressure and velocity by making Venturi tubes. These were tubes with a choke point. You would think that putting the same amount of fluid through a narrower section of tube would cause pressure to increase, but it does not. To move the same amount of fluid through a smaller cross section, the fluid must speed up. As the fluid increases its velocity, the pressure, as read perpendicular to the flow, actually decreases. This is called Bernoulli's principle. Here you see a diagram showing pressure in green, temperature in red, and velocity in Mach number in blue. As the fluid, gas or liquid, which is subsonic here, moves from the combustion chamber or pump in this direction, it converges and speeds up. Reaching Mach 1, or the speed of sound in this specific fluid, through this throat area. When it comes out the other side, something strange happens. At subsonic speeds, convergence makes a fluid speed up. At supersonic speeds, Mach 1 and above, divergence makes the fluid speed up. That is why hypersonic and supersonic engines have a vastly different design from subsonic ones. The exhaust gas would speed up and goes supersonic. You would get some thrust if there were no nozzle at all. But expansion of the gas in the nozzle increases the force generated and improves efficiency. The first industrial converging-diverging nozzle was built by Ernst Kording in 1878 for use in a steam jet pump, but he kept the technique a secret. Later, a Swedish engineer named Gustav de Laval used them for his turbines in 1888. His results were made known, and the design bears his name. The first application of this design to space science was made by Robert Goddard. Mr. Goddard was the American father of rocket science, the equivalent of Oberth in Germany or Tsiolkovsky in Russia. A rocket nozzle will allow the gas to expand. The expanding gas loses pressure. A perfect nozzle will allow the gas to expand until it is the same pressure as the outside environment. You can see one here. In space, where we have no effective outside pressure, we would need an infinite nozzle. That would have infinite mass. So we do an analysis to find where we have the maximum acceptable efficiency for the lowest mass. And we call it good. If you look here, you will see a sea level raptor and a vacuum raptor. The sea level raptor must be shorter. So the gas is about the pressure of the atmosphere at sea level. That's just a little more than one bar. The pressure in the combustion chamber is 330 bars. The Starship Super Heavy Booster will only have sea level raptors because it doesn't go all the way into orbit. As the booster climbs, the outside pressure will quickly drop. The perfect nozzle at sea level becomes underexpanded. That can seem confusing because it looks to be expanding too much. It is out here but the nozzle is underexpanded back here. When we say under or overexpanded, we are talking about the nozzle, not the exhaust plume. If our nozzle is too big at launch, the outside pressure might be higher than the pressure of the expanding gas at this point of the nozzle. This is called an overexpanded nozzle. Again, it is the nozzle that is overexpanded, not the exhaust plume. If the nozzle is severely overexpanded, the outside pressure can push its way into the engine. This will cause turbulence in these areas. This turbulence creates instabilities that can destroy the engine. When you see these shock diamonds, the nozzle is overexpanded. When you see this, 
the nozzle is underexpanded. But realize that every nozzle is a compromise. Computer modeling can tell what altitude to design the nozzle for, for maximum efficiency. Space by international convention starts at 100 kilometers. When the booster reaches just 10 kilometers, the atmosphere has already lost about 80% of its pressure. But rockets need the most thrust just as they're leaving the ground. Is there a better way? Understand that every percent of efficiency is vital to a rocket's success. If the Earth's gravity were a little higher, chemical engines could not get us off the Earth. As it is, we just barely make it. The delta V needed to get into space is about 9,400 kilometers per second. The major factor in determining delta V is the ejection velocity. This is the velocity of the exhaust as it leaves the end of the nozzle. Divide this by the force of gravity on Earth, and you get something called specific impulse. This is how rocket scientists measure rocket efficiency. Here is the maximum achieved specific impulse of different rocket fuels. Here you see that hypergolics are around 340 to 345 seconds. RP1 is about 358 seconds, methane is 380, and hydrogen is 455. The oxidizer to fuel mass ratio is shown here. It improves efficiency to add extra fuel, especially with hydrogen. For the same temperature, a smaller molecule is going faster than a larger one. Plus, if we maximize the energy of combustion, temperatures get too high, even for actively cooled rocket engines. So adding extra fuel keeps the engines cool and efficient. If we take our rocket equation and use a one for the initial mass, we can put in the exhaust velocity and end up with mass fraction left over. This is the fraction of initial mass that is left at the end of developing this much delta V. I'm sure you have noticed something here. The higher the specific impulse or ejection velocity, the higher percentage of your starting mass gets to where it's going. So why don't we have single stage to orbit spacecraft? Why must we have stages? Let's look at that. Let's say we want to get 22.8 tons to low Earth orbit. We'll use a Falcon 9 full thrust, which has a total mass of 549 tons. Let's pretend we are going to keep the rocket in one piece and throw it away. A single stage to orbit vehicle. Without staging, the final mass in orbit would be the payload plus the dry mass of both stages. The first stage has a dry mass of 25,600 kilograms, and the dry mass of the second stage is 3,900 kilograms. The total is 29,500 kilograms. Add that to the payload of 22,800, and we get 52,300 kilograms. If we put that into our equations, we see that the required initial mass is far above the initial mass of the Falcon 9 rocket. In fact, the only fuel that could possibly make a successful single stage to orbit ship is hydrogen. But efficiency isn't everything. The problem with hydrogen is the volume. Hydrogen is not very dense and it takes a truly massive tank to hold very much of it. But it is the only viable fuel for single stage to orbit. Here you see the DCX. If you think it's impossible for a large company to be innovative, consider the DCX. McDonnell Douglas was having stiff competition and decided in 1989 to create a small team to work on this concept. They had convinced Vice President Quayle that a reusable single stage to orbit space truck would be needed to service the Strategic Defense Initiative assets. The Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, was an American plan to put weapon systems in space. Former astronaut Pete Conrad was selected to lead the team. Astronauts believe in getting things done and making them work. Conrad decided to use off-the-shelf materials only. His motto was, fly a little, break a little. That might seem a little timid, and is quite different from Starship's motto, and vastly different from SLS and New Glenn's. But in all fairness, Conrad was not spending his own money. But if money is the most important thing in the world to you, don't go into the space business. It was recently reported that Blue Origin engineers are constantly admonished. Watch how you spend Jeff's money. I think if I worked there, I might get fired. For saying, why? Doesn't he have enough? Maybe we should watch how he spends our lives. In any event, Conrad was very frugal with the company's money. He selected 2219 aluminum alloy for the frame and structural supports. If you are unfamiliar with aluminum alloys, please watch this lesson. 
He then chose graphite epoxy composite for the aeroshell with a layer of silicone-based thermal protective coating. This lesson is on composites. And this one is on thermal protection. The landing gear would be steel and titanium. Yes, we have lessons on these too. Never underestimate a teacher's ability to create homework. The DCX used gasified hydrogen and oxygen for reaction control thrusters. This did not require separate hypergolic systems. And an F-15 laser gyroscope flight system for navigation. With F-18 accelerometers and rate change gyroscopes. To start off, he built a one-third scale test ship. This ship was 12 meters tall and 4.1 meters across the base. It had an empty mass of 9,100 kilograms and a fueled mass of 18,900 kilograms. You don't even have to break out your equation. We know from our previous work that with about 50% propellant mass ratio, this test ship is not getting into orbit. The smaller your ship, the harder it is to get your structural mass down. A three times bigger ship, which was the final goal, would have had a much better dry mass to propellant ratio. Sometimes bigger is better, but for a test ship, this was fine. The DCX was a vertical launch and landing spacecraft, whose purpose was to perfect vertical landing before investing in something bigger. It used hydrogen fuel and had four Pratt & Whitney RL-10A5 engines. These had a thrust of almost 65 kilonewtons each and could throttle down to 30%, very important for propulsive landing. These are very efficient Hydrolox engines with a specific impulse of an amazing 465.5 seconds in vacuum but that's with a nozzle ratio of 280 to 1. The sea level version has a ratio of only 84 to 1. The nozzle ratio compares the area at the end of the nozzle with the area at the throat, where the nozzle starts. The vacuum nozzle, as you can see here, is over three times larger in area than the sea level. What does this tell us? The DCX had only four engines. This worked great for launching, hovering, and landing at low altitude. But to get into space, this won't work. Firing these sea level engines at high altitude will be much too inefficient. And firing vacuum engines at sea level, if you could fit them on the ship, would probably tear them apart. A bigger single stage to orbit ship would need both types of engines. Construction on the DCX started in 1991, and it was flying by 1993. The DCX concept was sound, and it was tested extensively. Conrad himself would sometimes be at the controls. The DCX flew seven test flights. On the last flight in 1995, it landed a little hard, cracking the aeroshell. The team saw this as a chance to make improvements and had a new ship built by 1996. This was called the DCXA. Using a lighter Soviet-made aluminum alloy for the oxygen tank and a composite fiber hydrogen tank, they improved their propellant mass ratio. The control system was also improved. The DCXA started flying the same year. It flew four missions, setting altitude and duration records of over 3,000 meters in 142 seconds. All of this had been done for under $100 million. Compare that to the cost of the space launch system. But politics was closing in on Captain Conrad and the DCX. NASA was being pressured to go with a different company. Lockheed Martin wanted to build the X-33 single stage to orbit and they had more friends in Congress. The fourth landing of the DCXA was hard, and the rocket fell over, cracking the new composite fuel tank and starting a fire. This was the excuse the managers needed to kill the Delta Clipper program. But Captain Conrad had proven, long before Blue Origin and SpaceX, that you could land a rocket vertically. In fact, several of the engineers from the DCX project helped Blue Origin develop the new Shepard and their work inspired Armadillo Aerospace, Maston Space Systems, and TGV rocket designs. The X-33 program was started soon after. $922 million was invested by NASA, and another $357 million by Lockheed Martin. NASA had known by this time that they would have to replace the space shuttle. It had proven to be expensive, unsafe, and inefficient. The space shuttle had RS-25 engines. These were very inefficient at sea level so they could be more effective at higher altitudes. To make the space shuttle work, they had to throw away this giant tank, and they had to have two large solid rocket boosters. This was all to get 27,500 kilograms of payload to orbit. 
That's about the same as the Delta IV, and a lot less than the Falcon Heavy. But it didn't have to be that way. If they had a rocket engine nozzle that was perfect at every altitude, the shuttle could have worked a lot better. When the shuttle was first being designed, the engineers had not planned to use these nozzles. They wanted to use something quite different. Aerospike engines are called this because the early ones had a spike coming down through the throat. This caused the expelled exhaust gas to expand down against this spike, working like a nozzle. The other side of the exhaust plume is constrained by the ambient air pressure. That means that at low altitude, the expansion exactly matches the outside pressure. As the rocket rises and the ambient pressure is less, the virtual nozzle expands to exactly match the pressure at the new altitude. The aerospike is efficient at every altitude, even in vacuum. At first, the engineers thought the spike had to look like this, but soon they found out that they could cut it off here. There would be some circulation of gas into this area at the base of the aerospike, now sometimes called a plug nozzle. But it turns out that this creates an area of lower velocity, high pressure gas that pushes up on the base here, especially if you put turbine exhaust gases into it from an open cycle engine, thereby compensating for the loss of the extra spike. NASA had spent $500 million researching aerospike technology. They found that the engine and nozzle didn't have to be round. They could make small combustion chambers. You can see them being assembled here. And put them around an extended aerospike. This was called a linear aerospike. This is what the shuttle was supposed to have. Here you can see how this works. They built and evaluated two versions. One had 10 cells with a thrust of 125,000 pounds and the other had 20 cells with a thrust of 250,000 pounds. There were issues with cooling because of a higher heat flux and greater surface area, but these were manageable. And by adjusting the thrust, the aerospike can also be vectored. Some structures started a little heavy, but with optimization, this improved. NASA mounted one on an SR-71 and tested it at high altitude and velocity. The engineers started working on a full-scale version that would be big enough for the planned shuttle. But the contractor for the engines, Aerojet Rocketdyne, did not want to develop innovative technology. They wanted to do things the way they always had. They convinced NASA management to use the less efficient but more readily available Lodeval nozzle. Aerospike technology was shelved until the 1990s. Space scientists knew that while expendable rockets had their place, reusability was the key to sustainable space development. And it was obvious by then that the space shuttle was not really reusable. It cost $450 million each time the shuttle flew. And this was the 1990s. They could have launched at least four times the payload on conventional rockets. The shuttle was an amazing machine, but it was draining so many resources that NASA could not afford to keep using it. Then there was the Challenger explosion, not due to a fault in the shuttle design, but to being launched outside its operating conditions, against the wishes of the engineers. The Columbia disaster, however, was directly related to design compromises, with the shuttle being in the path of any falling debris from the upper parts of the main tank. A falling piece of frozen foam is what killed the Columbia. Even before the Columbia disaster, NASA knew they needed something better. After cancellation of the Delta Clipper, they started working on this. This is the X-33. This would have also been a single-stage-to-orbit spacecraft. It would have used hydrogen fuel and a linear aerospike engine. The X-33 would have launched vertically. It would have gone into orbit and deployed a payload, then re-entered like the space shuttle. It had a lifting body design that would let it land like an airplane. The vehicle was designed, evaluated, and simulated, and work started on the airframe. The team completed 100% of the launch facility, and they had acquired 96% of the needed parts and constructed 85% of the ship. When they kept having problems with the composite fuel tanks, the tanks kept rupturing. Composite tanks this big are difficult to make, even today. And hydrogen is extremely hard to contain. Composite materials were not developed well enough at that time to make the tanks work. The engineers wanted to just use aluminum. Aluminum had worked fine for the second stage tank of Saturn V and for the space shuttle main tank. But management decided that if they couldn't have composite tanks, they didn't want the X-33 at all. 
After canceling the $100 million Delta Clipper program, they had flown 11 missions. They spent over a billion dollars on the X-33 and canceled it just before completion. And this, scholars, is why we can't have anything nice. But most engineers were quick to point out the single stage to orbit rockets using chemical propulsion are not very practical. They will never get as much into orbit as a two-stage vehicle. With a two-stage ship, your booster can be optimized for sea level and your second stage for space. And hydrogen, despite its advantages, is probably not the perfect first stage fuel. Here you see a Delta IV medium. This is a hydrogen fueled rocket. Even with four solid rocket boosters, this can only get 11,475 kilograms into low Earth orbit. The Delta IV in this configuration is 63 meters tall. A Falcon 9 burning kerosene, or RP-1, is about 10% taller, but can get 22,800 kilograms into low Earth orbit. This is because RP-1, though less efficient, is much denser. This Delta IV only has an initial mass of 249,500 kilograms, half that of the Falcon 9. The Delta IV needs these three first stage tanks to get 28,790 kilograms to low Earth orbit. If you put together three Falcon 9 first stages, you can get almost 64 tons to low Earth orbit. That is why the SpaceX Starship is two-stage and burns methane. If you want to learn more about rocket fuel, watch this lesson. SpaceX considered using an aerospike engine, as had Firefly Aerospace. But in the end, with a two-stage vehicle, Lodeval nozzles are good enough. They are a well-understood technology and sometimes getting the job done is more important than being perfect. But here's something for you to consider. This is the Starship booster engine bay. It does fine with sea level raptors and has plenty of room. This is the Starship second stage. It has three sea level engines in the center and around the outside are three vacuum raptors. It needs the vacuum raptors to get into orbit and the sea level raptors to maneuver and land. If you took a SpaceX Raptor engine and put an aerospike on it, it would need a lot less room. That would allow you to put more Raptors on the ship. This may not make much difference for an orbital starship. It doesn't really need more thrust, and you can get by fine as it is. Aerospike engines, however, can become extremely important under certain conditions, when you are trying to maximize efficiency but don't have a lot of space. Where would they be perfect? Here for the thrusters on Lunar Starship. The benefits of an aerospike engine are maximized in vacuum. These engines must generate a lot of power, and putting large nozzles inside the ship would be complicated and take up a lot of room. Using aerospikes here would be perfect, and also here, for point-to-point -point Starship. This ship would definitely benefit from a higher thrust and efficiency. Aerospikes would work perfectly throughout the entire flight. Something to think about. And a special thanks to our supporters. We appreciate you. Stay safe at Astro Proterra.